Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm coming at you with another video just kind of showing what is happening on our homestead this week. We're going to talk about incubating eggs to start our new flocks for the year. We're going to make some homemade baklava and then just talk about some other projects that are happening. So things are really starting to change around here. The weather is really changing and becoming lovely. We're getting a lot more sunlight in the house. Things aren't as dreary and gray and the workload is starting to change. Now that the pantry challenge is over, uh, we need to do some planning for some other projects. So we started the week, uh, Elizabeth and I sat down and we got out my planner and we did quite a bit of planning. I've done a video before on my planning system and I'll link it in the description of this video. But I am definitely a fan of planning because I'm a very busy mom and I at one point can have 10 different projects between homeschooling and the homestead and kitchen work and other things going on in my head at once. So I need a place to kind of sit down and um, write everything down and get it all out of my head so that my thoughts are a little more organized. And so on Sundays, I tend to sit down and do this and I plan ahead. And since this week was the beginning of a new month, it's also time for me to do some planning for the month. And so at the beginning of every month, I kind of assess our daily flow and the way our days during the week are going with homeschooling and everything. Um, I also sit down and set goals for the month that I would like to accomplish, whether it relates to homeschooling or homesteading or anything else going on. And then of course I do my normal weekly planning where we determine what meals we're gonna have and kitchen work that's gonna get done and other kinds of chores and things that I need to do with the children. And Elizabeth picked all of my meals this week, which was really exciting. It's fun to have her down helping me plan. Let me show you what we came up with. So here is for the month of March. This is sort of what our daily flow is looking like right now. And like I said, I just like to assess this at the beginning of every month to kind of help keep my days in order and see when I can fit in projects that need to get done. I also made a gardening list here of projects that I need to do. As I mentioned, we have our weekly plan. This is the meals that Elizabeth chose and we sat down and sort of figured that out. And then this is something new. I made a spring cleaning list. Now that the pantry challenge is over, I'm challenging myself to do some spring cleaning. So I made a list of 31 different deep cleaning tasks that I would like to accomplish this month. And every day I just pick one off of the list and cross it off. The ones with pink stars next to them are more detailed projects that will take a pretty significant chunk of time. And the rest of them are things that I could probably get done in 15 to 30 minutes. So when I have some free time, I can just pick one of those and get it accomplished. And so it's just that um, time of year. It's been a long winter kind of cooped up and the newborn baby has kept me very busy. And so I need to get my house in order. It's a great time to start some spring cleaning. It's also a great time to start incubating eggs. <laughs> the chickens are finally laying again. And so I decided to get out the incubator from storage and grab a batch of 22 eggs because that's what I can fit in my incubator. And we are gonna hatch some chicks. So when you incubate eggs, they don't need to be perfectly clean. If you think about a mama hen, they're not perfectly clean when she sits on her eggs, but an incubator is a very warm, wet environment, a humid environment. So um, if you have extremely dirty eggs, it's just a breeding ground for bacteria. So I take my eggs and I don't wash them, but I do kind of try to scrape off any chunks of dirt or filth that might be on them. And we're just gonna fill the incubator. I grabbed a different selection of colors and um, varieties. The green colored eggs are Easter eggers. The white eggs come from our leghorn chickens. And then all of the various shades of browns are mostly just a barnyard mix. We have some barred rocks, some Rhode Island reds, some ISA browns, just different varieties. And some of them are, are hybrids because they are second or third generation from our barnyard flock. So I'm trying to increase our egg laying flock this year and we are gonna kind of double the number of birds that we have in any roosters that we hatch. Those will be our meat birds for the year and all of the hens that are hatched will become our new laying flock. So very excited to get this started. We will probably do four or five batches in the incubator this year and the children really look forward to that. 
So we just have to add a little bit of water to the incubator. Um, in order to hatch, these eggs need humidity and they need heat. And I'll show you how my incubator here um, does all of that for me. This I got this off of Amazon probably four years ago. This is the fifth year using it, and it has already paid for itself, especially considering the price of chicks this year. So I just plugged it in, so my humidity and temperature gauges are still figuring themselves out. But I wanted to show you why I like this incubator. It has a candler on it. On days 7 and 14, we will check the eggs for fertility to make sure chicks are growing inside. And the candler is right there for me, which is wonderful. It has an automatic turner, which will rotate the eggs for me. You need to do that to make sure that the chicks don't stick to the side of the egg as they're forming. And then I can adjust the temperature and humidity as I need to, whether I'm hatching ducks or hatching um, chickens. So um, there you go. I like to keep my temperature around 99 to 100 degrees and my humidity needs to come down. I like it between 55 to 60 percent. So we've got it all plugged in and ready to go. And I'm going to show you over the videos in the next 21 days. That's how long it takes to hatch them. I will show you how they are developing and what they look like when they hatch. So I hope you'll enjoy that. Another exciting thing happened this week. Monday, it was my daughter Elizabeth's 10th birthday, and her request was for us to make birthday baklava. She didn't want a birthday cake. She wanted baklava. And there's a story behind baklava in our family that I'll share in a minute. But the first thing I needed to do was to get pistachio nuts all cracked and ready for our baklava. We used pistachios instead of walnuts. And um, I did break the pantry challenge one day early, or I guess a couple days early. Her birthday was on the 27th, and I went grocery shopping to get things like pistachios that I needed for her birthday meals. And that was how we ended the pantry challenge for this year. So David is making the bak baklava. He put a half a cup of almond milk, a half a cup of coconut yogurt, one tablespoon of baking powder, and a half a cup of olive oil into the mixer here. And then he also added one egg and four cups of flour. He tries different recipes every time. This was a new to him recipe that turned out wonderful, but he has to get creative to make our dishes dairy free and safe for our family to eat. Miss Elizabeth here, I think is eating more pistachios than she's cracking, but it's her birthday. So we'll let her do that. So then David took that dough and divided it into three equal um, balls of dough. And then he separated each of those three parts into 16 pieces. And that is what he's going to roll out to make his homemade phyllo dough. Am I pronouncing that right? Phyllo, phyllo, whatever it is, those like baking sheets that you get to make homemade baklava. David likes to make his from scratch. Although every time he starts making it from scratch and he remembers how difficult it is, he's like, oh yeah, mom, this is why people buy it instead of <laughs> making it. But he does a great job. So you need to use a lot of starch. You can use cornstarch or arrowroot flour and you take each one of those 16 little balls and roll it out in as flat as you can get it. Stack it up, maybe four or five of those rolled out um, balls, and then you put that stack together and roll it out even flatter and just continue the process until your sheets of dough are as thin as possible. He'll hold it up to the light to check to see how thin it is and just continue to do it. As he stacks those sheets, he will make sure to put tons of arrowroot powder or corn cornstarch on the dough so that they can peel apart like this. If you don't put that starch there, they're going to stick together and it's going to be a big mess. And like I said, this is the point when he's pulling these apart that he's like, oh yeah, mom, this is why people buy it and don't, <laughs> don't make it from scratch. But he does a really great job. He's very patient. And this is definitely a labor of love that we are doing for his sister um, because this is what she really wanted for her birthday dinner dessert. So baklava became a thing in our family. Probably four years ago, David did a geography curriculum for his homeschool work, and it took him around the world to different countries. And when he got to Egypt, um, each country had a recipe that he had to do. And in Egypt, baklava was the recipe. And so he made it, and it turned out so amazing and delicious that the family started requesting that he would make it for other various celebrations that we would have. And it quickly became a family favorite. So that is 
why she chose baklava, and that's how David sort of became our baklava baker in the house. As I mentioned, this was the end of our pantry challenge, so we were using up some tapioca starch that I had on the shelf. I figured it's a starch. It will work the same as cornstarch or arrowroot powder, and we quickly learned that the tapioca starch was not great for the purposes of making baklava. It's sort of gummed up between the sheets of dough, and so we quickly decided that we much prefer arrowroot powder. So just in case you were ever going to use tapioca starch on your baklava, I definitely wouldn't suggest it. Stick with your cornstarch or your arrowroot if you need to make it um, gluten-free or something like that. So we um, just working. I love bonding with my son over baking. Um, it's just a fun activity, and we chat and joke with each other, and I feel like I really get to know him while we work together. Next, we grabbed those pistachios, and we need to smash them down into smaller pieces. And um, you can use walnuts. Some people prefer to use walnuts in their baklava, but we really uh, like the taste of pistachios. And the kids, um, I think they think the green, the color of the pistachios is kind of fun for the children. I also have a greased pie plate back there. So once we get our nuts completely bashed down and crushed, we're going to start making our baklava. So I'm going to grab my greased up pie plate and we're going to stack about uh, four or five sheets of the dough and then sprinkle on a layer of the nuts and then repeat the same thing. Four or five more sheets of dough, sprinkle on the nuts until our entire pan is full. Now typically baklava is made in a more rectangular shape and you would cut it into diamond shaped pieces. Whoa, look at that mess. Whew, it's a messy process. Anyways, you would normally cut it into diamond shaped pieces, but we like to do it in a pie plate and just cut it into um, pie shaped pieces. And then you're going to bake this in the oven on 350 for about 50 minutes. In the meantime, make yourself a simple sugar syrup. You can add a little bit of lemon juice to it. And you just want that to be a thick, nice sugar syrup. It is best to cut your baklava before it goes into the oven. I was supposed to do that for David. He was busy doing school. And I said, oh, I'll put this in the oven and cut it. And I forgot to before I hastily threw <laughs> the baklava into the oven. And it's not a big deal. You can cut it afterwards. It's just the top isn't going to be as pretty because it can kind of crack that the crust that's on the top. But it was no harm done. It still tasted just as delicious. So we cut that into our little shapes. And then we're going to pour our sugar syrup over top. Having it cut then allows that syrup to kind of drip down in between the pieces and get everything all sweet and gooey and delicious. And then you're going to want to let this sit for uh, several hours before you actually eat it to let that syrup, um, sugar syrup kind of solidify a little bit and not be as wet. So later on that night, our baklava was all done. We put some candles in it for her to blow out. And we celebrated my beautiful second daughter's 10th birthday. I cannot believe she is an entire decade old. It's just amazing to me that 10 years has flown by in just what feels like a moment's time. But my daughter Elizabeth is a blessing and a joy to our family. She's just a gentle, beautiful spirit. And um, I just love having her as a daughter. I'm enjoying watching her grow into the little woman that she is becoming. Once she finally got that candle <laughs> blown out, we were able to taste our baklava. This is what it looked like. Lots of yummy layers, and these children are very excited. We let Elizabeth have the first taste to get her birthday seal of approval, and I believe she really enjoyed it and was very excited and glad that she chose baklava over her birthday cake. So, all right, high five for my baker boy. The next project that we needed to do this week was make a toy, like a play area for Hannah. She's getting much more wakeful and needing a little more stimulation as she lays there. She's just not as content now at almost three months old to just lie there. So instead of spending money on one of those expensive toys that will just be used for a short time, we decided to use what we have. David went out and got some PVC pipe that we use in the summer to make a hillbilly golf game that we play outside. Since we're not using it right now, he kind of took the pieces and built a frame out of that game um, to make a hanging toy. The girls 
went up and got some of their cute little stuffed animals that Hannah would enjoy looking at and trying to reach for. And they just hung them very securely with double knots so that nothing could fall down and just hung them over her. And she is loving it. It gives her something to stare at and entertain her while we're busy doing other things. And this is what I like to do. I like to kind of use what we have. A lot of these baby toys like this are used for such a short period of time that it doesn't make sense to spend a bunch of money on them when we can kind of cobble together something here out of things that we aren't currently using. And it's a fun creative project for the older children to get involved and figure out a way to make this for their younger sibling. And they really enjoyed um, doing this for her. And, and real, now they really enjoy watching her play with it. It just makes them very happy. And speaking of happy, little Miss Hannah here absolutely loves it. Look at those smiles and giggles. <laughs> so the first day, obviously, this toy was very novel. So there were plenty of children wanting to hover around her. I might even say that Hannah got a little overstimulated. When you're the youngest of eight children, that can often happen. You never lack for entertainment. There's always someone that's going to entertain you and stimulate you. And on this day, it was little Mr. Benjamin. He, I think, wanted to play with this toy as much as her. Um, but I'm glad that he was doing that because it kept her very happy and entertained while the rest of us needed to get our schoolwork done. So Hannah is laying on a sheepskin there under the toy. I highly recommend getting your baby a sheepskin. It's great for them. It's good for their skin. It's good for regulating their body temperature. It will help warm or cool them depending on um, the time of the year. And it's just so soft. It's the perfect little place for her to lay down and be comfortable. So this um, day we got a lot of schoolwork done because both Benjamin and Hannah were so content playing. So very excited about that new addition to the house. And I'm assuming that will keep her busy for the next month or so until she starts rolling over and wanting to play in other ways. I am back doing the GAPS diet now, which means I can't have grain. And so I thought I would show you one of my favorite breakfasts I've been making for myself. It's just three ingredients. I use eggs, some kind of nut butter, or we use sunflower seed butter, and then a pureed squash. We're gonna use home canned butternut squash that we preserved last fall. Got a girl coming in from doing her morning chores. So all I need to do is drain my canned squash here and get as much excess moisture out as I possibly can. We don't want our batter to be too wet. And then I'm gonna add equal amounts of the sunflower seed butter and eggs. And then we're just gonna stir that up until it is all mixed together. You could do this in the blender if you would like, but that squash is soft enough that I can just kind of mash it down and no need to dirty my blender up at this point. So we're going to mix that together and pour it into our waffle iron. You could also turn it into pancakes. And then this is a grain-free um, breakfast that's kind of sweet. You can drizzle it with maple syrup or honey or something like that. And this is what I have been eating. If you guys would like to see more GAPS recipes, um, let me know. And I'll show you some of the grain-free, sugar-free, soy-free, dairy-free <laughs> meals that I have been eating and um, if you don't know, I have Crohn's disease and I manage that through diet. And the GAPS diet is what I have found is best for my system. And now that um, Hannah is a little bit older, I feel comfortable adjusting my diet and it won't affect my milk supply and I can get myself healthy and try to lose some of this baby weight. It's hard cooking grain-free for a family that does eat grains um, but I've found that I've been doing this now for 10 years and there's joy in it. Whenever I find myself craving foods like this, I just end up baking something for the family. And for some reason, making it for them and knowing that they can enjoy it brings me a satisfaction and in a strange way kind of um, takes away that craving. And so making some breadsticks for the little boys or for lunch, we were having spaghetti with some garlic breadsticks always have eager helpers that want to shape the dough for me. And it's fun. It's like playing with Play-Doh, but <laughs> we get to eat it after we're done. So I love having these little helpers in the kitchen with me. Other exciting news happening this week on Three Rivers Homestead. <laughs> My oldest son, Gabriel, is now old enough to get his temporary driver's license. He spent much of the beginning of the week 
studying online. They have a booklet that teaches them all the rules of driving. On this day, uh, a little brother curled up next to him and fell asleep while he was studying. I thought that was precious, but Gabriel worked really hard to study up on all of the rules, and um, he eventually would go later on in the week and take his driver's test. And I'm, you know, I thought this is something that I thought when he was younger, I thought we would get to the point that he was ready to drive and it would make me nervous or anxious. And I'm actually really excited for him. I'm excited to have another driver in the house. I'm excited for him to gain a little bit of independence. He's such a responsible kid that this doesn't worry me. And so thankfully he passed his test. He got his temporary license and now we're teaching him to drive. And this is going to be great. He's going to start, um, he will turn 16 in August and then he's going to start college classes in September, um, kind of doing dual enrollment college while he's doing um, high school. And so that is going to give him a lot of independence. I'm very excited. The other exciting news happening around here, you can see the destruction that is happening on our back deck. We are starting this cellar project that I've mentioned in several videos. And the little boys in the house were very excited. It's like they had a TV, a living TV happening all week long. They could watch this happening with the big construction vehicles. We are going to be waterproofing the foundation of our house and our cellar so that we can turn it into a functional food storage area. So the first step in this was removing our back deck. It was kind of bittersweet. It's sad to see the deck go, but better things will be coming in the future here um, and we'll replace the deck. So here was an old 100-year-old cistern. They had to pull it up out of the ground. This was under the deck, actually, and then they had to fill it in. So that was part of the work that they did this week. And then the next thing that they need to do is tile and get some drainage away from the house. So from back here, you can see what the back of our house looks like. That's where the deck was ripped up. There is our cellar. That is eventually where our food storage will go. And so here is the tiling that they did. I'm just going to kind of show you the progress that they did on this project. They, they are running the drainage from the house over here and tying it into the drainage from Adam's garage. And it just runs around the back of the building. And it drains out back into our what we call our junk woods. It's just an area that we let grow wild for the bees back there. And so the extra moisture won't hurt it. Eventually, we hope to build an addition on the back of the house here where the deck was. But before we can get to that point, we've got to fix the foundation of the house. So all of this is going to be ripped up. Our house, um, the original portion, was built in 1867. It's a very old house, and it needs a lot of work. These are old fuel oil lines, and um, there's big holders underground that need ripped up. This is our septic system here. So they're going to do a lot of work on this during this project. And then they are literally going to dig out and expose the entire foundation around the house, patch it up. They're going to waterproof it. And then they're going to fill it in with stone that will improve the drainage to get this cellar wet. Because right now it's a very old, wet, damp cellar. And we want to be able to use it and clear up space in the front of the house. As I mentioned, our long-term goal is to build an addition on the back of the house that would create a larger dining room because we are, <laughs> even with this big dining room table, we are very quickly outgrowing that space. And as children age, we're thinking ahead to the future where they might bring home um, a spouse or have their own families over to eat. And we want to have a really large dining room area and a dining room table where everybody can sit together. And then we also will create a new family room um, area in that space and then our current family room will be turned into a, an extra bedroom that our teenage boys will move down into and that will clear up some space in the boys bedroom because right now there are five boys sharing a rather large it's a very large bedroom but I feel like our teenage boys would like a little privacy and space away from their little brothers so that is the goal hopefully we can accomplish all of that <laughs> Um, but the first step right now is that cellar project, and we are very happy to see them do that. And that's about it that was happening around here this week. We'll be back next week with another video showing some other projects that we're doing. As always, thank you for watching our videos and supporting our family by um, commenting and liking and just subscribing to our channel. You guys are a blessing to us, and we really appreciate you. 
Thank you for everybody that participated in the Three Rivers Challenge. And now that that is over, we're going to start looking more toward growing food and videos about uh, gardening and all of the other things happening on the homestead. So, all right, we'll see you later, friends. Bye.